Science and the humanities have developed separately over the past century. Uh, we have programs and departments to teach specialized courses, but we still don't know how to educate rigorous generalists. People often think that the uh, generalist can be a speci uh, failed specialist, but I believe that rigorous generalist can be a scientist, engineer, artist, or humanist, capable of working together to integrate the seemingly disintegrated parts into a collective whole that can be greater than some of those parts. We need to make conscious efforts to create and nurture more interdisciplinary programs on the campus. Currently, there is a lack of uh, interdisciplinary training and opportunity for undergraduates. Most of them are not even aware of the best number of interdisciplinary fields. I think we need to expose them to those fields to inform them of career options outside their own disciplines. I know so well from my own professional experiences how hard it can be to communicate or collaborate with people of different training and backgrounds. I work, have worked for the last 20 years in the field of wetland mitigation, creating or restoring uh, wetlands to mitigate the loss of natural wetlands, which uh, inevitably requires me to work with a lot of different disciplines. For example, I have to get to work with engineers, economists, landscape architects, urban planners, and policymakers, and stakeholders like uh, farmers and uh, landowners. Earlier in the practices of wetland uh, mitigation in the United States, more than half of the mitigation projects turned out to be a failure, not meeting the even legal success criteria. The failure in the project mostly came from failure in communication among all the parties involved in this project. Because they were all using the different languages from their own fields. Speaking of language barriers and the cultural um, differences between different disciplines, I know so well at the very personal level because I came to the States 20 years ago and then started my life here as a graduate student. Yes, I had, I had a language barrier, but not long after, I've learned and realized it's not just about the language, but the culture that you, you really need to understand on the other side if you want to communicate. So, I also learned from, the, my, from my professional experiences that the uh, actual contents of the project, any project, can really benefit from other perspectives. Um, often, uh, there's a lack of communication between departments or disciplines on a college campus, which is just naive ignorance of how other perspectives can add value in what we do. We should not forget what we have in common, that is our shared interest in education, scholarship, and service to our community. So I wanted to, um, I decided that I wanted to change this, facilitating the communication and interactions between different departments. Starting with my own field of ecological science in the college campus where I work, right here at George Mason University. So I started a new initiative back in 2013 called EcoScience Plus Art. I've been committed and then, um, to finding ecological design principles in my research over a decade uh, applicable to land and water management. It's not much different from um, the works of artists, especially eco-artists who take their art making into finding and providing creative and then insightful solutions to real world problems. Both of our approaches intend to improve our relationship with the natural world, often working on the relationship between structure and function. I found a colleague from School of Art. Uh, Mark himself was an eco-artist and has been teaching the art for a number of years on the campus to work on the initiative together. Um, one of the major components of this eco science plus art initiative is speaker series. We have had so far four speaker series. The most memorable, memorable one has to be uh, our very first inaugural event back in the fall of 2013 with legendary pioneer eco-artist Patricia Johansson with her talk titled Art, Ecology, and Infrastructure, which fairly sums it all up for what this initiative is all about. 
Another critical aspect of this initiative is student participatory projects. So I designed a project and then labeled as the RAIN project. Uh, last year, it was about last summer, I created and designed this project. The goal of the project to raise awareness for stonewall issues for Mason community uh, and uh, showcase the interdisciplinary year-long project by students from science, engineering, arts, and humanities, working as a team to design and implement green infrastructure on the campus. As you know, we live in an era of climate change. Climate change is really a story of water, especially rainwater. Water is the way in which we feel the effect of climate change through the cycles of droughts and floods. Many U.S. cities are now turning to green initiative, looking out for finding novel technologies and innovative green infrastructure that mimics the way nature collects and cleans the water. The green infrastructure in the rain project, project that I designed is a flooring wetland that improves the water quality in stormwater pond by removing pollutants and the nutrients, especially nitrogen and phosphorus. As you well know, too much of which can cause algal bloom and deteriorate or de de degrade qualities in many water bodies in the United States and around the world. The plants and then the bacteria in their root zone transform the pollutants in the water flowing over them into life-sustaining nutrients. Um, it all started with the drawing. At the very beginning of this semester, actually on the very first day of the class, I provided students with the uh, sketchbooks and the color pens. Mm -hmm. Their re reactions were very interesting at first. Uh, they were, were not as comfortable. And then saying things like, Dr. Ryan, what are these for? I haven't drawn anything. I, I cannot draw. My brain doesn't work that way. We often hear people describe themselves strictly left-brained or right-brained, with left-brainers maybe bragging about their math skills, and then right-brainers touting their creativity. But recent neuroscience says they might have a different search tree, but they need each other for a fully developed functioning brain. Being able to sketch something to communicate your idea is such a powerful and a useful tool. And the student also went through several steps um, that take to conduct a research project, which involved several sessions of discussion and the heated debates, and then mutual learning from one another's disciplines, including hydrology, botany, water chemistry, living ecology of water, and also cultural and historical backgrounds of stormwater management. We also, uh, we finally had this kind of design as a final product for the uh, floating wetland to be built, which is a human kidney shape, as wetlands are often called as kidneys in the landscape for their abilities to uh, filter impurities in the water passing through them. So students paid a lot of detail, uh, uh, attention to the details for this design. And then, uh, we also went through uh, some kind of small scale simulation just about a couple of weeks ago. On one Friday, you know, one rainy Friday, we had got, got together outside and then uh, carved the medical material into human kidney shape and then planted some of the chosen vegetation um, to filter the water, which really has prepared the students for the, all the details that, that they have to pay attention to for a full scale uh, implementation of a floating wetland. So now we have a date for full-scale launching and then construction of the floating wetlands. Um, I'm actually inviting all the audience members. Uh, on May 12th, um, you're going to be able to see the entire construction and implementation of the floating wetland in Mason Pond, the major stormwater wet pond at the center of George Mason University campus. We are studying all of it, so come anytime, and then the floating wetland will be there throughout the summer. Uh, plants will be growing, um, and then becoming a really a great habitat for other biota in the water. That day, not only you're going to see the construction and implementation of the green infrastructure students have worked on the entire semester, you're going to get to see the student presentation. 
Um, my undergraduate students have, who have worked on this brain project will present their uh, research outcomes and learning experiences to K-12 students invited, not to their own peers, but they have spent the entire semester together. <coughs> their peers already know what they've been working on, and all the concepts and spe specific jargons and the terminologies. But for the past three years, I've been using peer, near peer presentation as a tool to train my students, especially undergraduate students, in science communication and communication in general. This kind of practice challenges them because it requires them to revisit, relearn, and then retextualize some of the key concepts and then their research outcomes to be able to translate them in more lay terms communicate with the K-12 students who will come without any prior knowledge about the subject matter. So, this kind of process seems to really reinforce and consolidate their learning experiences. Currently, uh, in natural sciences, including the, uh, the, in the field of ecological science I'm in, they're calling for training graduate students as renaissance scientists. Some of you probably have heard, of that, heard about it. Individuals with strong disciplinary expertise, um, in addition to competencies in strong collaboration practices, being able to collaborate outside their own fields, but most of all, the ability to communicate effectively about science with diverse audience outside the scientific community. To address environmental problems and or related social and cultural problems, we need to be able to get the community to agree with us to move forward, which requires great communication skills. Effective communication will bring us the type and level of collaboration that we need to address and solve big and complex problems we're facing as a society these days. We often hear that we live in a world of information or data overload. We need to make conscious efforts to turn the data into information, information into knowledge, and the knowledge into eventually wisdom to share as a community. Art being added to ecological science will facilitate that. And I believe that the uh, art will also assist us to bring ancient wisdom to a more contemporary context to create solutions for our teaching and scholarship. I see art as a great catalyst in changes we need to make in science education or college education in general. And then this message is for me, a scientist. It's really about following science and innovating college education. The experience that students have gained so far from the RAIN project will prepare them for success in any careers as well as ecologically literate citizenship. I believe ecologically literate people should be able to understand our relationship with the larger context of life, hopefully appreciating what it all means being fully human. I was happy observing the emergence of social and emotional intelligence among the students who have worked on this RAIN project throughout the semester. They could come to an agreement regardless of their differences in their perspective and opinions solely based on their own disciplines throughout the project. We all know the power of intelligent, uh, emotional intelligence in communication and leadership. Those who understand how other perspectives can add value should be able to explain or put things in ways people understand. I believe that's what we need. So stay tuned uh, for more that I want to share with you from the RAIN project uh, as it continues for the rest of this year. Thank you.